Hello, dear friends. I would like to give um, a short idea on Parshat Vaera. This is the second portion of the book of Exodus of the book of Shvat. Now, I call this what is in a name, because as you know, the book of Shmot, second book of the Pentateuch of the, of the um, book of Moses, is also called Exodus. And the Exodus, referring to the Exodus from Egypt. And Nachmanides of the 13th century also calls it the book of redemption, because we go into slavery and we come out of redemption uh, through the desert on the way to the land of Canaan, the land of Israel. But in Hebrew, it's actually called Shmot, which means the book of names. And the question is, is it just arbitrary because it's the second word? These are the names of the children of Israel. Or is there something deeper to it? And I'd like to argue that there is something deeper to it. This And this particular pericope, this particular parsha, is um, one that we can see referring to that. Let's just think for a moment. The book of names, how does it start? Shmot. It starts describing in the first parsha the names of the Israelites that come, the children of Jacob of Israel who come to Egypt, and he names them Reuben, Shimon, Levi, Huda. And um, they come to Egypt, and if you notice, in already in Parsha Shmot, you go from names to no names. You go from names, the children of Jacob, and all of a sudden, there is a new king of Egypt who did not know Joseph, meaning he forgot the name. And even this king is not even called Paro. He's just called the king of Egypt. Even the name Paro is forgotten. And then he talks to <clears throat> these um, midwives who are called Shifra and Pua. Of course, the Midrash says that's not their real name. And then it talks about there was a man from the tribe of Levi, doesn't say his name, who marries a woman from the tribe of Levi, doesn't mention her name, and then they have a son. And this son, who they put in the Nile, who eventually we called Moses, does not have a name. He's given a name by Pharaoh's daughter. So what is this about the disappearing of the names? It goes from having a name to the disappearance of names. This already is to prepare us to understand what's going on here. The people of Israel going into slavery is called the disappearance of the name. The name is your identity. It becomes the meaning of who you are. A slave has no identity. A slave has no name. A slave is a number. A slave is an object. The movement of the Israelites into slavery is the loss of the name. Now let's just understand for a moment what a name is. When I call somebody by a name, there are two aspects to the name. The name is first of all what I call myself, which means when I try to understand who I am. And the name is also what all other people call me. What other people call me is their comprehension of who I am based on all the sum total of the interactions between myself and that person. So if somebody else says Rafi, for them, whatever I appear to them over the time, whether they knew me artificially or knew me better than that, that will be what that name means to them. If it's a politician, whatever the newspaper said about them or the television. If it's an actor, whatever movie they played in, okay? And even yourself, when you say your own name, or when you, you normally you don't say it, but you think it, it's the way you perceive yourself. But of course, we know that the identity is the soul. It's the self. It's the person. So sometimes even with the ourselves, our understanding of ourselves is uh, secondary to what we are. Sometimes we spend years and years trying to understand ourselves. So the name, in a sense, is a search for identity. The loss of the name is a total loss of identity. As the Israelites go into Egypt, they have lost their identity. Now we have a very large history 
of the attempt to look for identity. We are all the children of one of the, there are three sons to Noah, who starts the world again. There is Shem, and we as Jews are descended from Shem. That's why we're called Semites, from the word Shem, Shemites. Not only us, but all the descendants of Shem are called Shemites. Those who don't like us are called anti-Shemites or anti-Semites. And of course, the name Shem, one of the three sons of Noah, you have Shem, Cham, and Yefet. Shem means a name. It's somebody who's interested in the identity of things. What is their name? What is their meaning? What is their purpose? Why are they here? Shem is a continuation in that sense of Adam. If you remember Adam, after God creates Adam, Adam calls names to all the animals because he wants to understand what is my relationship to them. The Talmud in Sanhedrin actually says that in the as soon as in the fifth hour God created of the sixth day, uh, the fifth hour of light that God created Adam, the next thing Adam did was call names to the animals. It was called the sixth hour. So Adam is interested in understanding the world around him. That's called giving names, giving identity, categorizing, trying to make sense of the world which is around us. That's called the name. But there is another figure who is trying to recreate the name for the Jewish people. And that's Moses, the child who was born without a name, who received his name from the palace of Pharaoh, from Pharaoh's daughter. From, he received the name from the outside. And what name did he receive? Moshe. Of course, that's the Hebrew variation. There's a discussion about it might have been an Egyptian, but I'll put that aside for the moment. The, the Hebrew name Moshe is the letters, right? Mem, Shin, He. If you flip it around, it's Hashem, which means the name. The task of Moses is to return the name to the Jewish people, to teach them what their name is going to be in order to self-identify, to self-identify. However, Moses goes a step further. And he knows that the goal of the Jewish people, of the Abrahamic vision of the house of Jacob, is a relationship with God. So for Moses, it's not enough just to know the name of himself and the people. When Moses gets the revelation in the burning bush and God appears to him, God says to him, uh, God says, I want to take the pe my people out of Egypt because I heard their pain and their sorrow and their screams. And Moses says, but if they ask you your name, what am I supposed to say? Moses wants to know the name of God too. How do we identify with you, God? What is our relationship? How do you relate to our lives? We know you're transcendental and infinite. What is our interaction? What is our relationship while we are in this world? Tell me. God says to Moses, I will be, which I will be. Sometimes it's tra translated, I am, which I am. But in the Hebrew, it says, eh, yeah, I will be, which I will be. And Moses says, and then God says, just tell them, I will be, has sent you. Rashi, the famous commentator from Troyes, born in Worms in the 11th century, he says, what does that mean, I will be, which I will be? He says, for Rashi, God is not telling his name. He's telling what he's going to do in history. He will always be with the Jewish people, just like he's always with the downtrodden and those who need his help and those who look for a relationship. I'm always there. I'm there with you now and I'm there with you in the future. There's going to be a special relationship with God between God and the and the children of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the matriarchs, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. And um, <clears throat> this is called Eheye. It's interesting, there is a discussion, Maimonides, when he talks about the seven names of God which are not to be erased, he does not include Eheye as one of them, which would, of course, strengthen Rashi's idea that this is an idea. 
However, the Kabbalists, like Joseph G. Katila, does include a, yeah, is one of the names, but it becomes the name that comes before all the names, the names of the infinite, the name of the crown of the Keter. So Moses then, therefore, is, God says to me, but then surprisingly, in this week's Parsha, Vaera, God appears to Moses again after Moses' first mission to Egypt sort of failed because Paro decided now to make the burden even more on the Israelite slaves. And he comes back to God complaining, what was the point? Now everything is just worse. And God says to him at the end of last week's Parsha, don't worry, you will see. It may look like it's worse now, but this is just step one. And then in this week's Parsha, the Parsha of Ayer, it says, Vayera, El Avraham, El Yitzchak, El Yaakov, El Shaddai. All of a sudden, God is now presenting himself to Moses by names. I appear to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the name El Shaddai, which means, depending on how you translate it, El, of course, means the ultimate power. Shaddai can either mean the one who controls nature, according to Abraham ibn Ezra, Shodet Amarchot. Others say Shaola Amarlo Lamodai, who created the universe and told it to expand until a certain point. So I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the name El Shaddai, Ushmi Hashem Lonadati Lehem, but I did not reveal to them the secret name of the Tetragranaton, Shem Havaya the main four-letter name of God. Now, Rashi already points out, and others, that Abraham does use the name Havaya, Hashem Elohim, by Mayadak Yerashena, O Lord God, how will I know that I will inherit the land? But it's not that they didn't know the name. God didn't reveal him, her, itself in this level of El Shaddai. Of, of El Shaddai, yes, meaning God, the revelation of God was as if what's called an revelation through nature, but the transcendental revelation of the name of Havaya is only used by Moses. This appearance of God through Havaya, which is a higher level, is a level that God reveals himself to Moses. Why? According to Judah Levi, because at this point, the Jewish people have to be formulated, and there's going to be miracles <laughs> that are going to have to happen until they get to Sinai and through the desert, and at the same time, there is also a message to the Egyptians simultaneously. So there's a whole plan, historical plan, which is happening. And then all of a sudden, the God who just said, I will be which I will be, when he appears to Moses, he says, now we have a plan. What does that mean? Why all of a sudden does God have a name? And before it was just, I will be which I will be. I'll try to explain this very briefly. We do not know the essence of God because as human beings, we are finite and God is infinite. And therefore, by definition, we don't really comprehend the concept of the infinite. However, we can understand the relationship between God and the universe. These are the names. The names are not the essence, it's the relationship. We are in a constant relationship with God. And every name, you know, the Hebrew language is a very, has probably the most, the most names of God of any language. In the English language, you have God, the Lord, and that's about it. In Hebrew, you have 10 names for God. And many, many, uh, um, according to Maimonides, seven, according to the Kabbalist, 10. And many, of course, connotations. Hamakom, the place, the rock of Israel, Tzur Yisrael. Kadosh Israel, the Holy One of Israel, and many others, Tzavaot, the Lord of Hosts, etc. So there are many, many names. According to the Kabbalists and earlier in the Midrash and rabbinic literature, every name re represents the way God governs history, the way God is involved in history, the interaction between God and history. So Moses, who is now at a turning point at the beginning of Jewish history, when these tribes are now turning into a people. He asked the question earlier, but now God says, now that these tribes are gonna turn into a people, I have to tell you something. 
when I revealed myself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it was El Shaddai. It was through the natural processes because they were individuals, righteous individuals, but they were individuals. Now that we're going to work on the national level, which is going to be a universal concept, you need to know that there's one other level that has to be involved. It's called the name of Havaya. The main name, Shem HaMeforash, the explicit name, because you're going to, this level is going to be involved now in the creation of this people. So Moses actually does get his wish in a sense, because God says, this is now names that you have to know, Moses, but they are relationships. None of them are actually the, the essence, but these relationships are how God deals with the Jewish people. So the book of Shemot has a twofold um, side to it. Number one, the identity of this people who's going into slavery, losing their identity, and now has to rediscover it, and then finally get their mission at Sinai with the giving of the Ten Commandments and eventually the Torah, the Decalogue, eventually the Torah, and the relationship with God, and to understand that God is with us at every time, whether He shows us his countenance or hides his countenance, whether it's in the land of Israel or in the diaspora, in the Galut, in the exile. And these are the two messages at the beginning of Shemot. The first chapter, which talks about the names of the Jewish people, and of course, eventually, the names of God, in the fact, this interaction between the individual, the Jewish people, and of God, which is being taught to us in the book of Shemot. Shalom, shalom.